the, what's the value of it. Thank you very much. Um, a question from the back and then on my right and then we'll get some answers going. Thank you. My name is Rose Hogan and I work for the IDL group um, in Bristol. And I was an interviewee on this um, survey when I worked for uh, UNEP in uh, Kampala last year. My question is the big money question. Um, there is lots of money supposedly floating around for adaptation, for mitigation schemes. How are we going to get that money to really work? Um, there are lots of questions about the old aid paradigm. So what paradigm can we move to? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and there was a third question, please. Hi, uh, Rod Harbinson from Panels London. I had the climate change program there. And I've been doing uh, training workshops with African journalists for about five years now. And this has developed into the Climate Change Media Partnership, which is an annual fellowship, uh, which is now in its fourth year. And um, I think one of the things that we're very much conscious of is the need, and I was very interested, Anna, and in your comment, to provide relevance. Mm. And because one of the characteristics of climate change is that it is very centric around the negotiations and the science that the policy and the science and breaking that open and giving it local relevance is perhaps a role where the media can uh, play a role. Um, what we're trying to do is really upscale the uh, volume of media coverage because it was very low five years ago in Africa, but we're also trying to improve the, the quality. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think we can say now that, that there is a bunch of journalists who really do know what they're talking about now um, in many different African countries. But we have other obstacles, uh, particularly, uh, I think Sally and uh, touched on this. This is the barriers that media houses themselves put up because of the commercial imperative and editors. So there's a lot of frustration amongst the journalists that I work with about how to overcome that. Uh, we're actually having a regional workshop in, in, in the autumn to bring journalists and the editors together to see if we can kind of pull that pull that open a little bit, but I, I would like sort of Sally Ann's reflections perhaps and any of the other panelists on what practical steps can we, do, can we take to, to uh, get the media more engaged in, in the whole debate. Mm. Thanks. Thank you very much. We'll pause there and we'll ask each of the panelists if they wish to, to reflect on, on these comments and questions. And perhaps after we have the three panelists, Jeff, we'll ask Samuel if he would also like to comment. So Samuel, if you're listening in, um, if you can think, if you wish to, uh, to respond. But first of all, um, mm -hmm. Sally Ann. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, my apologies, Anna. It's okay. Um, I mean, interesting set of questions. Um, in terms of structural s sort of supports in the media, I mean, that's come came out really strongly. Interestingly, when I was um, the day before we launched this research in Nairobi, um, we did a media. Uh, we spoke. To, we had a workshop the day before with editors, and some really just to brief them and try and encourage them to send their journalists to the uh, launch in Kenya the, the next day really interesting issues came out which speak to sort of structural barriers and facilitators along the way to this issue. I think from the World Service Trust's perspective, we've kind of learned, if like by our mistakes, that just do, doing media training alone isn't going to, to, to get, the, it will only get you so far. You actually do need to engage editors, you do need to look at the organisation and work with the organisation to, to change. At the, as I mentioned, this editor's breakfast, there was a, an editor from one of the vernacular radios uh, in uh, stations in Kenya who sort of said to us questions like, if there's a ca catastrophe, whose role is it to respond? Is it our job or is it the government's job? These are really important questions which I think should be discussed and de debated, but engaged not just with the editors and the media houses, but actually with governments, with NGOs and others. Others were sort of saying things like, what is it we should be helping people to understand? Is there clarity amongst international NGOs, governments, about what people need to know about this issue? And that's what we mean about these sort of na national messages, local messages, and elsewhere. So the media are clear about what their role is. In addition, the, old, the older question came up about advertising and that being an, a, a barrier. So I think there is a really important role to ha start having these discussions 
and to, to think through what that sort of support can be to the media. Um, to go back to the idea, of, I think, about synergies and collaboration, I think that links in nicely there, in that we really think that... I had an interesting conversation with some of uh, Kip Warner, who's been an advisor on Africa Talks Climate, all the way through, and I sort of said, you know, we know there's this issue, we know there's a need for information. Is there a... And we know that probably creating space for this dis uh, re locally relevant discourse could be a way forward. But is there, is there clarity amongst uh, NGO, international NGOs, local NGOs, about what people need to know? And he said that's a really interesting and crucial question mm -hmm. and one that needs to be debated. Mm -hmm. So I haven't got the answers yet, but I, and I think that we'd like to be part of the conversation moving forward. Um, and as the beat working with the BBC World Service and the B World Service and BBC, there's a really interesting um, angle with our global reach and our ability to convene and connect in multiple languages. So that's why we think that we'd like to be part of the conversation. Good, thank you. Jonathan. Right. <coughs> well, I'm not going to be able to answer your question because I'm all too familiar with the idea of technical expertise getting in the way of good communications. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's why I've stayed a resolute generalist throughout my life for fear of falling into that trap. Um, I'm going to try and answer the question about um, what can journalists do in Africa, to, uh, what can they do more, as it were. And one thing I just want to touch on is, is, is getting good at telling the good stories. Mm -hmm. There are some fantastic yeah. things going on mm -hmm. in Africa around renewable energy in yep. particular. Mm -hmm. Absolutely fantastic mm -hmm. things. I'm a, a trustee of something called the Ashton Awards for Sustainable Energy, and every year we have this uh, amazing parade of, of just brilliant technology-based breakthroughs for... Um, often very poor communities throughout the developing and emerging world, but uh, Africa has had its fair share of award winners. And to be honest, it's not all that easy often for the award winners in those African countries to get the kind of attention and coverage you would expect. Mm -hmm. So there is a story about expertise in not just telling the science of climate change, but telling the, the, the way in which many people now in Africa are beginning to respond to climate change very practically. I can't quite remember the actual number of people who are still not grid connected in Africa, but it's tens of millions of people who, who aren't on central grid based systems and who are increasingly dependent on finding smart ways of using new ultra low carbon or zero carbon technologies. And I guess that gets on to my second point, which is we shouldn't be too politically correct about this. African countries are not blameless when it comes to exacerbating the climate change problem. There have been many policy decisions taken in the past in which African countries have failed to take advantage of some of the new technologies around renewables. And I have experienced in the past, and this may be a little bit difficult here, a sense sometimes in Africa that those renewable technologies, they're second best technologies. You guys in the West, you don't really like them. You don't do very much about them. So why are you dumping your second best renewable technologies on us? And we sort of need to understand that things have moved so far now. We would be lucky to be able to springboard some of the understanding about renewable technology into our own lives here in the UK. So I think there's still a bit of a bias in some African countries that renewable energy is a second best route to meeting energy needs for Africa. And that's a big issue. That's a big issue. Maybe that's not a very comfortable thought. And maybe that goes to the first question, which is what should we do about the aid paradigm? And that's too big a question for anyone to come up with really smart answers here. Um, other than just to remind ourselves from a slightly humble position that we, it has taken us an awfully long time to realize that climate change isn't an environmental issue of principal concern to the pampered middle classes. And if I'm being blunt about where DFID was 10 years ago, that's where DFID was. Climate change was an environmental issue, largely a worry to Guardian reading tree huggers. Now, the change in DFID over the years since then has been enormous, and thank God. And at last we've got to the point now where DFID does not see climate change as an environmental issue, but only just. And I don't think DFID yet fully understands the amazing array of synergistic interventions it could make if it really started to put low-carbon low and climate change at the heart of every aspect of its aid-related work. Not do it as a little program here or a big strand there, whatever it might be, but understand that no aid program is worth, is worth anything unless it's got the idea of delivering it in a low-carbon way. And we've still got to get to that point inside DFID. Sorry to DFID colleagues, but I'm sure you understand the journey we're all on here. And we are making progress, but there's still a way to go. 
I should just uh, interrupt to say that if there is anyone from DFID um, here, <laughs> they are more than welcome to um, provide a comment um, afterwards. Please just um, um, contribute to the debate. But on to Sally Ann, please. I mean, it's the same sort of point, really, um, to anybody in DFID. That, that's, it's great to see media put so centrally here because I think we all know who have experience working in Africa that the media has a real opportunity um, to tackle, in my view, the, even the accountability, which is a huge issue. To, but if we can work with African media to develop in a new way, in its own way, um, then that's possibly a mechanism for African publics to actually account back um, in terms of the development aid they're receiving from DFID and, and, and from other parts of the world. So I think media is, is crucial for accountability and a strong African media. Many of the barriers are actually the same as we, we experience in the UK. Um, I often find that there are very well informed, um, as, as the gentleman there said, uh, champions for climate change coverage, for knowing that they've got to tell stories that are actually positive stories mm. about what's happening locally that are relevant. But it's often their management. Mm. And I think anybody with media experience in the UK would say it's the same barriers. So I think it's engaging those management, those, those senior editors, those people who are actually selling the media spaces in Africa, that this is something that African audiences really, really want to find out more about and have something to say to the rest of the world about via their media. Um, I think the danger is that at the moment a lot of broadcast media in Africa um, really picks up on the Western media and we have a, a, perhaps a, a possibility of second-hand denialism mm -hmm. growing. Um, so that people, the public actually learn about how to deny climate change before they even learn how to um, are empowered to tackle it in their own way with their own voices and that, that really is my greatest fear in media's role but I think support for, for African media um, there is the enthusiasm um, and I think it's working with them to actually see climate change coverage as an opportunity I, I had a wonderful experience not in Africa but in Tonga running a workshop where we had the Pacific media come in we had a Pacific climate science very uh, senior Pacific climate scientists come in and talk to the media about um, you know, latest understanding of Pacific climate change and, and issues. Uh, on the final day of a two-day workshop, we brought in the local high school children who gave the scientists a far harder but more informed time than any of the media had done. But what those uh, local students did was actually talk about their own experiments because there's actually very few climate scientists practicing on the ground in, in islands like Tonga and um, they wanted to show their own experiments and of course the media we hadn't scheduled a third day where all the media got very excited about this because this is young uh, Pacific Islanders actually demonstrating climate science to the media and this became a wonderful radio and TV opportunity so I think once you can engage the media in that this is something we can show and talk about and, and, and actually is very accessible then I think there's plenty of opportunities there. Good. Thank you very much. Um, can we just check, Jeff, whether Samuel is online and whether he has anything to say? Um, we lost him there for a moment. Let's see if we can bring him back. Perhaps in, in the meantime. Uh, and oh, he's back. Oh, totally good. <laughs> <laughs> Please bear, bear with us. Um, it's just a, a very valuable contribution if we can get Sam's perspectives on some of these questions. Yeah, Sam, are you there? Oh, I know you were just there. You plugged into the right places. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see where he plugged yeah. into? Uh, last track. Last track. Left. 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 Let's try that again. Sam, can you hear us? No, I can't get you very well. I can't get you very well. Okay, we can hear you now. I don't know how much of that conversation you heard, but if you have any questions, please go ahead. Sam, Samuel, just to remind you that there were there were three questions basically asked in this first round. Uh, the first one um, addressed the issue of how to um, collaborate with technical networks. Um, what is the inf information people need to know? Then there was a question um, 
perhaps one of the most important questions of how to get the money for adaptation and to, to, to an extent also mitigation to work in Africa and what might be the role of the media in that. And then finally a question on how to upscale the volume of media coverage in Africa on climate change issues. Yeah, maybe just repeat the question for him, please. I, I hear you better than uh, the person who's asked the question. Okay, maybe you can touch briefly either on some of the research. Uh, if you have anything else you'd like to add, please. Well, really, not really something to add, but really just to say that uh, uh, information provision to, especially the farmers in Africa who depend on the rainfall agriculture, is going to be very important because really, the problem is actually to adapt because we are talking about a group of people who don't have information, therefore they're bound to begin to, uh, you know, adopting very effective ways to adapt to climate change. And funny enough, maybe those who believe that uh, the whole issue of uh, uh, the change in the weather and climate is actually a good issue might actually refer to prayer and fasting and, and that really is not going to help the lives of the many people who are already being uh, impacted very negatively by climate change. Thank you, Sam. Um, if we can, uh, I suppose just before moving on to the next set of questions, and if I can go beyond a little bit my role as the chair to come back to the question of money for adaptation. This is something we at ODI have been following um, closely over the last couple of years. And in response, and, and in particular, um, focusing on what role the media might play, my sense is that one major constraint that continues is that the relationship between North and South, particularly uh, between Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa, remains locked in the past. It remains locked in this paradigm of development cooperation. And perhaps the media has a role to bring out, as has been through all the UNFCCC negotiations, the fact that this is a very different form of relationship between the North and the South. And I, I think that message um, needs to get across as strongly in the South as it does here in the UK. But I thought I'd just add that as, as we hadn't responded particularly um, in detail to that question. We've got time for one more round. So, um, well, we'll try and fit as many people in as possible. Um, so if we take the three here, and this, we'll take four, and then we'll take the three on this side of the room. So we'll have two rounds of questions. So those seven people, please. Hi, um, Gemma Renier from DFID. <laughs> um, I actually focus on the um, Asia region rather than Africa, but I've come along out of interest for what you've done in Africa and, and whether we can look at doing similar projects um, to cover the Asia region. Um, we have been doing activity around um, engaging journalists, engaging opinion leaders. Um, last year we ran a conference in Nepal which was for across the, the entire region, pulling in opinion leaders, policy form, um, government. Um, but in order to get the media interested, we, we also organized a, a workshop alongside it for journalists specifically to discuss climate change and what it was and how to report it more effectively and we followed that up with a with a road trip across asia where um, for them to visit the key pockets of asia where work was being done to combat it but also the kind of problems that they were incurring so i just thought i'd share that with the group given the discussion but my actual question um was on um whether as part of the research you actually investigated how climate change was being reported and the kind of communications approaches that were being used mm -hmm. and how effective those were um or whether that that didn't really play a part i'd be interested because we are doing lots but we're not that sure how successful or not it's being at the moment. Thank you for, for that very clear question. The next speaker. Hello, this is Francesca de Gasparis from the Green Belt Movement. Um, as the Europe Office of the Green Belt Movement, um, we're really excited about this project. We think it's fantastic. Um, as you can see, our founder spoke at the launch in Kenya. Um, and because we're in London and we're here together talking from a UK perspective, I wanted to just 
bring out a point which I think is touched on in the report but not really emphasized here today, which is Africa talks climate. Africa talks climate. How can we learn from what Africa is saying about climate change? There's lots of knowledge in Africa, not just scientific or uh, you know, more recent students doing experiments, but traditional knowledge systems. Uh, climate change, and Jonathan, I want to challenge you a little bit on this one. Climate change is not just an environmental issue. I don't think it's not an environmental issue. I think it's not just an environmental issue. Um, because it, there is a very deep environmental knowledge in Africa, and I think we should acknowledge that, and hopefully that will help us maybe break through some of the blockages we have in the media to really come to grips with this issue in a real way. Thank you very much. Uh, third question. Hi, uh, my name is Tommy Stadlin from the London School of Economics uh, and a writer on climate change communications for the New York Times. Uh, my question is around the, the sort of central recommendation uh, from the research, which is all about information provision. Um, and my concern really is that we've had a great deal of information provision in OECD countries, including the UK. Um, and there's some research which, which basically says that information provision doesn't alone change behaviours, um, particularly if it's accompanied with kind of the negative messages which we've seen a lot of in OECD countries. Uh, my, my question to the panel is, is thoughts on that and can we go beyond just any old information provision? What, what type of information is it going to be? Good, thank you. And there's a fourth question. And just um, in the interests of equity, what we'll do now, because it's quarter past, we'll take the other three questions, so everyone who put their hand up can ask their question now, and then we'll have one final sort of comeback from the panel. So, please. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Phuong, uh, working for Challenge to Change, a charity in the UK, uh, working in Vietnam. Uh, also, I'm not uh, familiar with Africa, but I hope that the experience can help uh, in Asia, uh, especially uh, in Vietnam. Uh, because I don't think we have done a uh, great extensive research like this in um, in Vietnam. Um, the, the, um, there's one question that I would like to ask whether wh during your work you mentioned a lot about the ev evidence-based uh, research that means you, you try to find out the evidence from the local people and in through many qualitative uh, um, results. Um, but we have an issue when we work with a lot of donors for adaptation that they, uh, people are still pushing for a lot of scientific uh, data before they invest in projects and, uh, and work on the ground. Um, so do you have that country or do you have, first of all, the aim to uh, educate the people in different, um, the people who have to um, support the adaptation, that they understand that, the, that sometimes scientific uh, uh, information at the, on the ground is not always available, especially in developing countries. Uh, so there's no need to push for more research and scientific data for another 20 years. <laughs> in the developing countries. And also, do you find any constraint when you work with the media, the local journalists, um, uh, of helping them to de deliver the information which can buy both scientific data and um, the, the knowledge uh, from the local people? Um, so how do, do they have the constraint in dealing with both source of, uh, sources of information? Uh, thanks. Thank you. Liam, if you could just take it across to the three questioners. And can I just ask, please, uh, be as brief as possible. Um, I'm, I'm Julia Glyn Pickett. I'm working in the World Service Trust um, with Anna and other people, um, both in the Trust and across the BBC, to kind of lead the conversation about what we do next. Uh, I just want to kind of connect with the, uh, the things that we've sort of alluded to but not really talked about around story and discourse. And where our thinking is, is that um, both in the North and the South, um, the discourse is dominated by explanatory forms. And maybe this is part of what we now need to shift, that the paradigm shift is to move from a conversation uh, that's dominated by information, news formats and explanation to one that engages the human story because at the end of the day this is this is a, a very important human story and so we are looking at uh, in terms of the genre that we would be engaging with moving forward putting non uh, explanatory formats at the heart of what we will do so that we can find a way to support Africa to tell its story and through the telling of its story that we can 
uh, in some way broaden the story that we have um, at the global level. And the next thing really for us is to find ways to put the best of the BBC behind that challenge. And we hope that you will be um, working with us um, as we embark on that journey. Thank you for that comment. Um, two more people, please. Um, hi, Dan Walden from Plan International. Um, quick, quick one for the World Service Trust. Thank you very much. I'm wondering um, if there were any children and young people involved particularly in the research, um, mainly um, partly as a, from a kind of a youth media point of view, but also as, the, as roles in communicating in communities and, and kind of their, their grasp on new media. Good. Thank you. Thank you. And the final question. I'm Paul Robson. I, I do research in Angola, and at present I'm involved in uh, research which is doing something similar, asking people about their perceptions of uh, changes in climate and the environment. Um, I noticed that you said that uh, there was some kind of link with the technical people, and I wondered if you could explain a bit more what, what that means. Um, I found with what we, the information that we've collected is that actually climate scientists are very interested in this information because as yet there is a lack of information really about what is happening in, in the climate in, in Africa. And particularly with rainfall and rainfall uncertainty and changes in, in growing season. So I hope that this information you've collected actually is useful and I wondered whether you have been feeding this to scientists. I would be a bit worried if you are actually using scientists' information to go straight into the media, because I'm not sure that scientists as yet actually really know what's happening on the ground in Africa with changes in rainfall. Good, thank you very much. I'll be very brief myself, but we've got about seven minutes left. We must finish at 2.30, I'm afraid. So what I'm going to ask each of the panelists is if they speak for two or three minutes, pick up what mm -hmm. questions they choose, and if the questioners feel they're not, um, it's not all been done, Please speak after the meeting ends. So first, Anna. <laughs> Go through it, <laughs> Thank you. Um, an interesting set of questions, and in three minutes, gosh, I don't quite sure where I start. But um, okay, a few qu quick comments following up from what Julia said. Um, and then one of the questions came over here about information provision. Yes, we're saying information provision, but we're also crucially saying debate. Um, we uh, also, one of the key recommendations that came out was we think there's a really important role for non-news media. We know from doing research in, in many parts of the world, lots of people don't get information just from news media. They get information from local discussion programs, talk programs, dramas, other forms. And so we're saying, what about those forms? In terms of evaluating how coverage now know, I know there's been some interesting work that others, like panels and things, have, have been involved in. Um, we did look at that. I think that um, it would, it's an interesting point. Would look like, I'd be interested to know more. Going back to sort of Gemma's point, I think I'd like to talk some more. I know we're due to talk. Um, and I think it'd be really interesting to look at lessons learned from con these convening and workshops, what's worked, what's, what hasn't worked. How do you make that more of a long-term strategy to effectively engage with the media? Um, I suppose my final sort of point is just in relation to, do we wait? Is the science data there? I mean, I think that there's enough data there that we're making policy decisions in the UK and elsewhere about this issue. So therefore, there is a need to start to have that sort of debate locally within, uh, in, within Africa media. And I'm not seeing it so far, um, but, I'm, but it's, it's an interesting uh, observation in terms of do we know enough about the coverage. Um, in terms of youth, briefly, mm -hmm. In Nigeria, we did actually target younger people. So we did a larger scale pilot in Nigeria, and we deliberately spoke to sort of 15-year-old school children up to 18. When we scaled the research up to go to the other nine countries, budget constraints meant we had to sort of limit down the, the number of people we could speak to. So we actually only spoke to 18 to up to sort of older age groups, into three different age groups. What came out interestingly in Nigeria with the youth groups is they were, on a, um, especially school leavers, one of the most informed about it. Mm -hmm. So that's a really interesting opportunity. But we didn't go to those younger people in the other countries. Um, so interesting area for future research. Excellent. Jonathan. Well, three things quickly. Um, firstly, very much uh, liked this idea, Julia, talking about this in terms of focusing more on human stories and mm -hmm. 
uh, enabling people to see their way through into many of these issues via the f uh, framing for real people's real lives. Slightly unnerved, however, by the concept of non-explanatory formats. <laughs> um, I'm not sure we've quite got to the point where we can do without explanatory formats. And actually, that came back to um, Tommy's question here about well, how's the content going to change. <laughs> you know, look, we're still in a world where people don't know the difference between weather and climate. Mm -hmm. This is a certain kind of awareness. It's it's yeah, but we've got awareness deficit so big. You know, we had a bit of a cold snap this winter, and guess what? Climate change is gone. <laughs> I mean, this is, you know, we're in a seriously dodgy territory here where almost you have to do some explanatory stuff as you go, as you go into some of these story-based... Um... Yeah, no, no, of course, of course, of course. Okay, so if I've got one more thing, I'm going to come back to Francesca on climate change is not only an environmental issue. Okay, I feel really strongly about this, because to describe climate change as an environmental issue, or even not only an environmental issue, I just think is, is, is the problem. Firstly, climate change is not an issue. It doesn't matter whether, it's, whether you put the word social or economic or environmental. This is not an issue. This, is, this isn't something you can add to a long list of issues that we've got to deal with. And if we see climate change as an issue, that in the first place is to frame it in a completely wrong way. And it isn't an environmental, whatever it is, because we just established it's not an issue, so it isn't that. <laughs> because essentially what we're dealing with is a set of really complex interlocking systems failures in our human economy, which is leading to equally complex feedback in nature. And of course, that's the bit where the environment comes into it. But it's that order. It is the systemic dysfunctionality in our human economy that is leading to these feedback failures, if you like, in the natural world. So I'm very nervous about framing this as an environmental issue, I must admit, or even not only an environmental issue. Sorry. <laughs> we will. <laughs> and, and finally, Sally Ann. I mean, really picking up on Gemma and, and uh, Tommy. Specifically, um, I know what doesn't work in my experience with broadcast journalists, and it is broadcast journalists um, internationally, is taking something in and telling them what they should be telling their audiences. Um, and I don't know enough about your specific Asian projects to know what's going on. What I do know is that this, for the first time, I saw a change in a room with a lot of media houses, from mainly from Africa, but Commonwealth-wide. And the difference was, you can do the explanatory stuff, in a relevant and engaging way by telling stories, good stories, and the best thing we can all do, and it's amazing considering we've had very few discussions between us, that the consensus we've come to, which is empowering the African media as a platform for telling African stories, and a lot of them as positive stories. Mm -hmm. So I feel very encouraged. Yes, there's a long way to go, but I feel very encouraged by one step on mm -hmm. from here. Thank you very much. And it's with some regret that I have to um, draw this uh, interesting discussion to an end. I, I would like to thank on behalf of ODI all the speakers who came today and also to Samuel in Kenya for <laughs> contributing. Um, we didn't completely get 100% on communications, but we tried. <laughs> um, and thank you all for uh, attending yourselves. Um, please feel free to uh, come back to other meetings, hopefully on this issue at ODI. Thank you. Thank you.